I have always painted only still life since I got out of art school. In art school, I made me do many things that I never wanted to do again. Um, and I was just never interested in theater. While Colorado has fabulous landscapes, they're too big. I mean, it's like I feel the awe and the grandeur there, and it's like, how could I ever, how could I ever do anything like that? So, um, I've been a still life painter since uh, before I knew I was a painter. Um, one of my art school teachers, who was also a mentor, he always said for all of us to, to paint what you feel most passionate about and to communicate your message as clearly as if you were calling for help. And one of my goals has been to do that. There's not much really subtle about my paintings. Um, it's like if, if do it bigger, don't do it at all. And so, and then I started getting, making it bigger. Um, and so, but when I first left art school, I was uh, really happy if the objects in my paintings looked like the real objects. I mean, that was, that was a big win in those days. Um, and so, you know, learning art is like learning how to write. It's first you have to learn the alphabet, then maybe you can make some words and you hope they're spelled right and so on. And so I'm, I'm really very happy to be at this point in my career where I, I can actually write a paragraph. Um, um, so learning, just learning to paint is a lot of work. You know, people see, unfortunately, there's not much about art education in our country. And so um, pretty much the greatest art education, educator in America is Bob Ross. And when I've said that with disparagement, um, some people have said, but at least he got people to paint. It's like, well, okay, he did some good, and because they don't have anybody else doing that sort of thing, he gets to do it from the grave. Even better. Um, so people tend to think that making art is easy. That you just, you know, I remember oh, there was a women's group I belonged, I belonged to it for a couple of years, and there, it, women were, they were from everywhere. And one woman said to me after a couple of years, she said, it must be so nice to be an artist and get to go to lunch all the time. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, well, my kitchen sink. You know, the company's so good too. You know, <laughs> me in the sink. Um, so, before I get started on anything else, I want to tell you uh, a bit about the technique that I use because it's very different than what most artists use, how most artists paint. And um, so a couple of, I've heard a couple of people tonight sit and make remarks about the color in my paintings. And I appreciate that you noticed because I work really hard for that. Um, as artists, we're working with physical pigments. And they're great, and we're really lucky to live in a time when we get to have them in little metal tubes instead of pig bladders. So there's a lot that I'm really thankful for, but when I'm trying to paint um, glass or flower petals or whatever out in sunlight, sunlight and the way that we see things, it's all energy. And so trying to match that look of energy with physical pigment requires some trickery. And so, you know, I learned a lot about it, but then I learned about this technique that's called underpainting and glazing. And it's a technique that actually um, Ben Ike used um, long, long before anybody else. And he was using colored underpaintings. Now traditionally, an underpainting is done with earth colors. So they're really dead. Um, but I use colored underpaintings, which is, you know, I, I start with a, a toning layer and you can see it um, through the paint, actually most easily on gentle embrace, there's pink showing through the tissue paper, which makes it look like I worked a lot harder on that than I actually did. Yes, because that tissue paper is, I love the look of it, I love working with it, but I'm really, you know, after six days in a row, I'm really tired of painting it. Um, so I start with a colored, colored underpainting on top of a white canvas, 
And then I paint the background and tabletop on top of that. I consider that sort of setting the stage. And then I start with painting the objects. The first thing I do is, so I have a drawing that's on, on uh, tracing paper, and it's, it's a very detailed painting, but it's, there's no shadowing on it. It's not like a finished painting that I can frame and hang. Um, I see them as roadmaps to where I want to go. go. And so I can, that way I can transfer my drawing in layers, which is how I paint. And so I transfer all the, every, everything, all the details except for the flowers, I just do, just transfer the outline of those. And then I fill it in with white. And I use a very dense white pigment. Um, so that I've got a really nice opaque layer between the flower colors and the generally very dull background. Because no matter how opaque the paint is, it is still transparent at some level, it's still transparent. And what's underneath it will affect what you see. And I want the colors to be big and bright and beautiful and fresh. And so I put in that sort of barrier, but it's white which is very reflective. And sometimes I put on two or three layers. Just depends on how I feel about it or compositionally what I want to have happen. And so then I transfer all, after that's dry, I transfer all the details of the flowers and then I'm ready to paint. And when I start painting the flowers, and that's always what I start with, I, th I think I, I, I probably came to this method thinking, if I can't paint the flowers right, the rest of it doesn't matter. So let's just see if I can do this part first. And if it doesn't go well, then uh, I won't be out of much time I spend on everything else. So when I start to paint the flowers, I work with what's called an underpainting. And it's the same color as the flowers. Let me just. Um, so for these flowers, I painted them the same colors that they are, but really, really light. A lot of white paint. So they look dead. I mean, and red starts out as like a pepto bismol color. It's not particularly satisfying, but I know where it's going to go, so I know what it has to be. So it starts out really pale and anemic looking, um, and then when that's dry, that, that, that I kind of see it as at that point then the fun begins because then I can be putting on transparent layers of color. And I build those up in the lighter areas, there's not very much, maybe one layer. And in the darker areas, I think the most I've put on was 15. Um, <clears throat> that took a long time. Um, and so the quality that I get out of the color is, and I didn't know I was going to be talking about this, or I didn't put any examples in this, but I've got a white back part of a painting that's it's got a lot of white in it, and I put transparent colors on top of this. And so when you see it, you're seeing light that has passed through those transparent colors and is reflecting off of the white and coming back to your eyes through transparent color. So it's like looking at a stop light instead of a stop sign. So it's very luminous, whereas most painting is done just with opaque paint and then you're just seeing that opaque paint. But I really love the look and the richness that I can create with, the, with layers of color. And so sometimes I think, you know, it'd be really a whole lot easier in my life if I just make the paint once, instead of painting areas of it so many times. But I love the look of it, and so that's what I do. But it, it's in part my sort of trickery to be able to paint the illusion of light passing through these petals with physical pigment. So, um, I learned to love nature from my grandparents. And, you know, they took me on camping trips all over Colorado. I was just happy to be with them. But they, fortunately, we live in a beautiful state, and they took me to places that people really can't even go to anymore. Um, down by little rivers and, you know, they did a lot of fishing. I ate more fish than I ever wanted to. 
I don't need it anymore. Um, there was a lot of travel in my life, but it was worth it to be with them out in nature. And what they did for me was they taught me to see how beautiful nature is. And something that we don't think very much about is we need to be taught how to see. And really, I don't know how it is in other countries, but we don't really do a very good job of it here. And I've, I've come up against that when I'm teaching art. And the main question that I'm asking my students is, you know, they're working from photographs, and I point to something in the photograph and say, can you see this? Can you see this whole thing? They say, no, I'm not doing quite now. And that's because they haven't learned how to see yet, to really see the details and the specific things. So with my grandparents, I learned that certain things were considered beautiful and to learn to feel them. The, the greatness and the grandeur and the wonderful colors and the smells were so wonderful. Those can just take me back like that. So they taught me how to look at nature. Now they didn't know they were doing that. They were just sharing what they knew and wanted me to share it as a part of it. Um, but I've come to realize how much I love nature goes back to that. To them sharing it with me, pointing it out. I always love to read, I still do. And so we'd be driving around these gorgeous mountains and I'd have my head in a book. And my grandmother said to me so many times, get your head out of that book and look out the window. Just take a look here, it's something pretty good. Um, and I will always be grateful to them for, for that, because we do need to be taught how to see. Um, they also, on those trips, taught me to listen to nature, to listen to the sounds. Now, this was obviously quite some time ago, and so there weren't you know, any electronics, there wasn't even radio out camping like that. It was just us in nature with all that it had to give. And it has a lot to give. In the sounds and the smells, it's all right there and it's wonderful. And so when you experience something with all of your senses, you're more likely to remember it. And so I remember those experiences really, really well. So they taught me to listen to nature, um, you know, I think for all of us, as, as we get older, we're more inclined to listen to nature. Because before that, you're just in such a hurry that, you know, okay, fine, I listen, but I've got this music. And so I just, I think that that's just something that's really important. Um, in my first college education, I got degrees in biology and chemistry with the idea that I was going on to medical school, which I did for about half a year, and then at that point it became really apparent to me that I was not with my people. It was not where I belonged. And, but what I learned in that education has, has, that has stayed with me is that all living systems, whether it's at the cellular level or the environmental level, want to be in balance. And nature is really good at staying in balance. You know, it might swing this way a bit, it will correct itself. It goes this way, it will correct itself. Unless humans are muddling around in the middle. And that's certainly what we've done. Um, and so the classes about the, the environment in, in college really fascinated me. And that information caused me to see nature and life and living systems in a whole new way, in a way that I'd never considered before. And while there are many things I probably missed in that education, that's one of the things that's informed my life ever since then. Um, and then at, a, at another point in my life, I, I was reading books about uh, vegetarianism, and you know, I was a city girl. I, my parents didn't garden. My grandparents did, but it was all flowers. And so I just really didn't have any idea where food came from other than the grocery store. I'm pretty sure that some of you can identify with that. It's different now, but you know, the world was pretty small and narrow there for, for part of our lives. And so, in reading about the connections that our food has to the earth and the health of the earth has 
to do with the health of the food, and then that has to do with the health of the people. That seemed really important to me. That this is something really important, and I wasn't seeing it around me very much. And so when I first got into painting, I was painting a lot of produce. Just a lot of produce. Fruit is so beautiful. We were growing things in a garden. It was our early years of gardening, um, which mostly wasn't pretty. Um, I think it was the first year that we planted a vegetable garden, and we worked so hard on that, and then we had a hailstorm. And it was just flattened. And then we learned about hope. Okay, we have more seeds, we can go buy more plants, we'll just give this another try. And it went better, and we got some produce, and I started painting it. And I enjoyed that a lot, and I was very much becoming an environmentalist. And so when it came to deciding what I wanted to paint, it was things of the earth, things that come from nature. And through a lot of evolutions, I came to settle with flowers because they are really beautiful ambassadors and emissaries of nature. People love them, they will look at them. Um, one of the other things I learned is that people think that a painting of fruit belongs in the kitchen. And I'm not kidding, I wish I were, but if you're really lucky, it goes in the dining room. And not very many people are putting really nice original art in their kitchen. And, but flowers hold a much, a much more elevated view by people. And so I, you know, through some discoveries, I started looking at flowers more. And then I started painting, you know, with uh, flowers from a florist and the grocery store. But we were still gardening. And I was getting gardening catalogs. And I was looking at those thinking, there's a lot more here than there is at the grocery store. There's way more here. This is a lot more fun. And so at that point, the gardens evolved and got bigger. A lot bigger. And so everything that's in the show, except for the orchids, everything else, we grew in our gardens. So I have a real personal relationship with all of them. I, I make the last few years, I've been so busy painting that my husband has done most of the work, um, but I think I might have said more prayers for them than he did. Please God let John do it right. <laughs> and so, as I was in, in art school and just sort of coming up learning, learning about art, at that time in the 80s, everywhere out there was abstraction. It was very popular then. It was very difficult to find a gallery that would represent realism, and <clears throat> let alone find an, an education for it. Um, but I managed to um, de demand the education that I wanted, because I was in my 30s, and I wasn't just an art student. I was also a consumer. And I wanted the education that I needed. And if I thought someone knew how to do it, then I got kind of pushy about them showing me. It's like, damn it, teach me. So there, there was, I sort of call my education the damn it, teach me method. Um, I got what I needed, but so much of it wasn't necessarily given freely. I had to really push for it. Um, but in retrospect, I look at that and it's like, they didn't necessarily know what I needed to know because they had all been taught abstraction. And so whatever they knew about realism was enough to make their art, but it wasn't, they hadn't been educated. And so fortunately that has changed at least in the atelier system, not necessarily in colleges, but in individual studios, they, they teach the kind of realism now that I really wanted. Um, but at that time, <coughs> I had magazines, I had books, and then more books to look at for what kind of painting is there? What, what can I work, what can I kind of work from or towards? And so when, when we got into art history, and I discovered
discovered the 17th century Dutch, I thought, wow, I want more than these three slides about it. Because <laughs> in that survey, you don't have time to do a deep dive on anything. It's all just the surface. Um, but I'm really good at educating myself, and so I did that. Um, and so finding my way through learning how to paint realism was oftentimes through looking at paintings in books up by the Dutch masters. So I learned by looking. And if, you know, I thought if they can do it, I can do it, hopefully. But I can tell you, I spent a lot of time in my studio wishing they'd come and teach me. Um, but, but I learned. And, um, and I loved their symbolism. I loved the idea that people could read a painting. And so when I finally got to the point where I was good enough to make a painting um, that, well, those early paintings were meaningful, but you know, when I, when I could finally make paintings and I was beyond the letters of the alphabet, and I was maybe into a phrase, <laughs> um, I started looking around for symbols that I could put in my paintings. And in our culture, there aren't any. I mean, there's plenty of icons like the McDonald's arches and, you know, whatever. But there's not symbolism that runs through our culture. It's just not there. Um, and a lot of what the, the Dutch were painting was very religious. I didn't want to make religious paintings, and people don't understand that symbolism very much anymore either. And so there wasn't a, a universal symbol system, and so I thought, well, okay, fine, I'll make it up. Let's make it my own. I will take authority into my own hands here in my studio, and I'll do it the way I want. Um, and so, in, in, in my paintings, I have used um, symbols for, for a long, long time. Um, I, I mention them to the people who sell my work, and I hope they get passed on. That's what I can do, and, and uh, paintings that I have on my website, I always have something about the symbols or the experience of the painting or whatever. Did it go to sleep? Oh, I know. My computer died. Hold on. Cord. Okay. It would, have, it would have taken me so long to figure that out. <laughs> I'd have stood here thinking, what did I do to the computer to make it so unhappy? And I would look like a monkey with a stick up here. Um, but you. Some of you probably know how far you can get with a computer and stick. <laughs> so that's pretty darn far. So some of the symbols that they that they had in their paintings were um, bubbles that that spoke about the brevity of life um, and the suddenness sometimes of death. Um, they used glass glass and dishes. Um, either whole, intact, or broken, and the broken ones were speaking about, because they, when they had something broken, it was usually something really nice, and it was about, you know, don't pay attention to earthly things. Um, those aren't going to last. Um, so the, the dishes and the glass, broken or not, uh, symbolized fragility, and an empty glass meant death, and I used that one in um, the, the painting with the orchids, Mysteries at Risk. Um, there's a little picture in there of no one. Um, the, I was planning to do three large paintings about the Amazon, um, but I was looking at a limited amount of time, and they were going to take forever to paint, and I had to get a certain number done, so those aren't done yet. Um, but I. I did put that into glass in there to uh, suggest death. Um, oftentimes in the broken dishes there were glass goblets, and the glass that they were making and buying from, from really all of them was really beautiful. It was all hand blown, some of it was exquisite, and I can, I can only hope that the way that they got broken glass was by accident, you know, that it wasn't okay, I've got this really nice piece, but I really have to make this painting, so I'm going to have to break it. I just, I can't even imagine doing that. Um, 
We're alive again. Yes, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Um, can also, in paintings, which, and I haven't used this at all, is decaying flowers that talked about the, the decay of the body and the, um, the, that we're all mortal. Um, let me back up here. Um, in this painting, there's a lemon. You notice lemons a lot in Dutch painting. And they're visually fascinating objects because, especially when you cut them, you get the juicy flash that's reflective and really pretty, and then you get the texture of the outside. And so it was oftentimes an opportunity for an artist to stretch out a little bit and try to paint some of those different textures. Um, although my feeling about that is if you can paint that silver dish, a lemon is an easy thing, because that dish is very ornate. Um, but you notice that even the ornate, um, I think it's a compote, is on its side. Again, that things are brief. They break, they end. Um, the, and then uh, there's the broken glass there. I just hope it's some pieces that somebody swept up after an accident. Um, and so what I found was that I needed to make up my own symbols because who here understands a lemon? It's also about the brevity of something that's really pretty, but three days from now, it's not going to be so great. So pay attention to the things that are really important, like your spiritual life, rather than the, the lovely objects around you. So it, as you might imagine, it takes me quite a while to make a painting. They're, they are very labor intensive. Um, and so they need to be meaningful for me. If other people don't get it, I have to be okay with that, but I have to keep myself entertained in the studio every day. And it takes a lot to entertain me. I, I realized that when I got out of art school and I was there alone in my studio and I thought, where's the entertainment? <laughs> and I realized that uh, if it doesn't come from me, it's not gonna happen. So part of that is just challenging myself to new things, new ideas, um, and, and figuring out symbols. And so some of my, one of my favorite and, and earliest symbols was the stacked rocks, or rocks laying somewhere in the painting, um, to symbolize the earth, that everything comes from the earth. Um, when I stack them, they look like a, a carn, which those have been stacked rocks have been used to mark trails and mark directions for thousands of years. And so they're a marker to pay attention. There's something important here. Um, and then I use glass, um, as you can see, whole or um, broken, as in, yeah. as in this painting, um, called Appropriately Broken. Um, I had been thinking about making a painting with broken glass for quite a while, and I thought, you know, it came to me that broken glass would be a really good symbol for these paintings about climate change. And so, uh, I went to Goodwill and I bought like three of each of two kinds of vases because base, I didn't know what size I wanted and I didn't know how I'd feel about when they break, does it look right, whatever that could be, hoping that I would know at the time. And so it was a summer that we had just horrible forest fires in Colorado. And so often along the front range or the eastern side, we had smoke. And we had smoke, and smoke turns the light very orange. It's a very, I think probably because I know what it's coming from, it's a very ugly color. And it colors everything very in a very ugly way. So getting a day when these flowers were blooming with sunlight that wasn't corrupted by the smoke turned into quite a problem. And so we'd gone up to Boulder to, to do some shopping or whatever. We were on our way home, and I looked at the sky, and I thought, my gosh, it's blue. There's no smoke and the sun is out, and we shouldn't be here on this road. We need to be home where I can photograph this stuff. And so we were headed home, and, and I, so I got to thinking, okay, how am I gonna break this glass? Because I've spent a long time trying not to break it. You know, I, I have a really lovely vase collection, and some of them are, you know, inexpensive, and some are uh, rather expensive. And I photographed them, on the patio, which is concrete.
And so, wind is not my friend. Wind is my enemy. Um, and I work really hard to keep them in one piece. And so the idea of actually breaking glass was really foreign to me. And so I was thinking, well, where are we going to do this? And I thought, the driveway? No, that's not a good place. And I thought, well, we could do it in the garage. No, that's Joan's workspace. That's not a good idea. I thought, the pet? No, we can't do it. And no, we have pets. So I was just kind of running my brain around in a circle about where can we break this? And then I, I, said, I said to Joan, I said, do you have any ideas? You know, I can't figure out where to break it. And he said, well, in the recycle bin. So I've been just chewing along on it, you know, thinking, how, how are we going to do this? And he just comes up with it like, like that. Mm -hmm. So it can be really useful to be married to an engineer. Mm -hmm. He's very, very useful. Um, he makes all the frames for my paintings. He built all the crates that they're shipped in. Um, when, we, when I was first getting to know him, he was telling me about the house that he had in North Dakota before he moved to Denver. And he was telling me about the work that he'd done on it, that he built a brick fireplace, and that he had built a deck and the hot tub that went in it. And that when he was make, building the, the fireplace and chimney, um, you know, he had to change some, some of the uh, wood in the house. And one of the things that I was looking for at that point was, the, the only way I could put it to myself was someone who works with their hands. Someone who understands what it is to work with your hands. And that you need time for that. And I didn't want to be the entertainment community. So when he said he built nice things, I was like, this guy's a keeper. <laughs> and um, it was a really good decision. Um, and I can absolutely honestly say that I wouldn't be able to do what I do without his help and support. Because certainly while I was painting this show, um, he did all the cooking, um, most of the cleaning. Um, he did just about everything except work on the paintings. Um, anyway, um, so here I had this broken glass and you know, I was worried about, will I get it right the first time? I've got backups. And the, when, I, when, I, when I, was, I was setting it up to, to, to be able to, to get it with a hammer, John came out of the garage with a bouquet of hammers. Which one do you want? And I just want the metal one. You know, with the two things. <laughs> And so I, so I, I think that I took that one, and I thought, how hard am I going to have to hit this thing? So I took my best guess, and I thought I hit it pretty hard. So I, I slammed the hammer into it, and it just went ping. It's like, yeah, it's because this is cheap glass. If this were expensive stuff, it'd be gone. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I think on the third try, I got it great. Um, and someone was asking me about it earlier, and painting all of the points on it, the, the dangerous parts of it, was really difficult. Because I kind of feel things as I'm painting them. Does it, does it feel right aesthetically, but just am I getting the texture that I want? And putting the broken glass with the flowers was, was really rather difficult for me, because I want the flowers to be okay. Um, and you know, we, we were driving home, I knew I wanted the lilies, we got home, and John took care of the dogs, and I went around in various gardens and cut the lilies, and I was really lucky, maybe because I'd been thinking about it for so long, when I laid the lilies down, they did exactly what I wanted. I didn't have to rearrange them, I didn't have to do anything. So I was really grateful when I got, just getting the photograph on this, um, I was just really grateful to make that happen, and then, um, and then it took me seven or eight weeks to paint this, and I was really, really happy with it when it was finished. I was also happy to be finished with it. Um, some paintings, usually, I've spent enough time with a painting that by the time I finish it, I'm ready for it to move on, like to a gallery or a show or whatever. 
Um, and so, you know, people have asked me, do I work on more than one painting at a time? It's like, no, I need to focus on one. And then towards the end of one, I might be working on the drawing for the next one, but I really try to stay focused on one. And so I'm kind of like the world's worst girlfriend in that, okay, I've dated you long enough, goodbye. <laughs> I'm moving on to this other thing, and I'm falling in love with it. Um, but every now and then, there is a painting that I really don't want to like or love, and this was one of them. That's one of my two favorites in this show. Um, so, this has glass, it has the rocks, um, and roses from my garden. And so I've, so I've used that symbolism. I've also used the broken glass. And then in this painting, the circle of light, um, I wanted to I, I wanted to use glass as a halo to say so this is sacred. It's really important. And of course, of all the photographs I did, it was this most complicated dish that I liked the best. And so, actually, I've never done this before, but I painted it once, and I wasn't really happy with how the flower turned out. And that painting it ended up selling. And I, and I thought at the time, oh, I'll just make it up. I'll, I'll get around to that towards the end of the painting for the show. I kind of wished I hadn't done that, but when I did it again, I did it so much better. I was really much happier with it the second time. And so, so I was happy for that. And then I was happy when I finished it the second time. Um, I've also used, uh, in, in this little painting that's not in the show, it's got the little sticky note there with a, uh, and, and in the world of office colors, that yellow color is called canary. And then I've got a little stick canary on there, um, and it's, it's called climate canary, like the canary in the coal mines, it, just as a warning. I was really happy when my husband mentioned to me, I almost took that note off your painting three times this morning. <laughs> Good, it's working. And then the man who stretches my canvas on stretcher bars, he said, I he was so glad you're taking that painting away because I wanted to brush that off all the time. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, I did my job. I irritated both of these guys who do so much for me. That's good. Um, and then I have used for protection, and protection's been a really important idea for me. And this was one of the early things I used was a niche. Um, it was really fun to paint, the, when I was doing the niche paintings, it was really fun to create this architecture that looked like it really was. Like it was really a niche in the wall. My husband then suggested, maybe you could paint us more space to put stuff in. <laughs> and I said, good luck. And then in this painting, I used the, the glass dome as protection. Um, and then right behind the, the little flower on the tabletop is that, I guess it's an empty glass. Um, and then the flower on the tabletop there as if it's dying. But while I was painting this show with climate change in mind, which is not generally a really positive thought, is about our changing climate. There's not a lot of good news around it. I was thinking, I want these paintings to be positive. I don't want, you know, if you, if you, if, if you painted something, an ugly message, and you paint it ugly and right in, the, right in the face, people are gonna take one look at it and just move on. They're not going to engage with it. So I wanted to make my symbolism really subtle so that you notice it after you're already into the painting. And so all of what I did was subtle, and I didn't want to put a lot of neg negative energy out into the world and then hope that people wanted to buy it and live with it. That didn't seem like a, a good thing. So, um, so, I, so I was kind of walking a fine line of getting my message out there and also keeping it something that people would want to move with. Um, and I use tissue paper. There's several paintings out there with tissue paper. Um, I 
love it. I love the way it looks when it's painted. I love the messaging with it. Um, but it's a real sticker paint. It's not my favorite thing to paint. Um, on the, the big painting out there with the amaryllis and the bigger piece of tissue paper, um, people ask me how long it took to paint that painting, and it took me three months of 10 hour days and, and 12 body albums. <laughs> so I can count things in time or days or audiobooks. And that one was 12 of them, um, in large part because of the tissue paper. Um, and then um, I used drapery. Um, in this painting, um, you know, I come from Colorado and I'm very influenced by the seasons there, and snow is a big part of it. And so in this, I was capturing the time of change in the year, but it's also a time of change with climate. Um, I was really happy when I came up with the idea for the background in this thing. I think you can see it, that there are subtle trees, empty winter trees, in the background. Um, and I, when I came up with that idea, I thought, okay, now the painting's complete. All I have to do is make it. Um, and, but I really loved that process and have done it a couple of times since then. Um, I do, again, an underpainting where everything is really light, really pasty looking. And then this one I went over with, I think, three layers of beautiful transparent blue. So when you're looking at it, it's kind of like you're diving into the color. Um, so I was really happy with that. And using, using the, the white drapery as snow. And then I've used drapery to be protection. Um, the day I photographed for this, I, was, I had some roses I wanted to photograph with drapery. And, you know, so much, so much of figuring out what I want to do, and I know it is for other artists, is just playing, guessing, and hoping, and hoping that you recognize it when it comes along. And I just happened to lay the drapery down like this. I suppose my subconscious mind knew what, what I wanted, and it made a perfect niche for this really beautiful rose. Um, and then in this painting, um, the the one with the blue background is time of change. And for this show, I wanted to do, I like that idea of a time of change. And I thought, well, at the time of year when there's a lot of change is spring. And so that meant tulips. And so I, <coughs> uh, many years ago, I did the photography for this with just the flowers in the vase. Um, I was not having a particularly creative summer. And so I just stuck them in the vase and photographed them and thought, well, maybe it'll be something later. And so as I was going through my photo references for tulips, I saw that, that photo and I thought, well, this is a starting point. It's not a finished idea, it's a starting point. And so I rearranged the flower some and shortened the stems and made it not so awkward. And then I thought, okay, for, for change and time running out, nothing better than a, um, what is that called? <laughs> An hourglass. And when, in a, any still life painter's life, there's stuff that doesn't necessarily relate to itself. It's kind of an odd collection of stuff. And because you, sometimes I want to clean out my still life stuff, but I know better because whatever I throw out today, I'm going to want next week. So I keep it all. And so I found these hourglasses at uh, Pottery Barn, and they were on sale, and I thought, those are great. I don't know when I would use them, but I know I'm going to want them sometime. And so um, then, I took, then, then I took just the vase and the hourglass um, out to photograph in the same sunlight. That's the key to being able to put things together, is it's all got to have the same light. So I photographed that, and then, then I went in and I just sat down at, at the dining room table where John was and, and said, what's a symbol for change? I need a symbol for change. I'm not coming up with a symbol for change. And I just, you know, it's like, let's brainstorm this. And I'm oh, what's a symbol for change? And I thought, change, coins. And I left him so fast. It's like, well, I've got it, bye. <laughs> I'm on my way, and he's fairly accustomed to that. He doesn't consider it rude. It's just she's got other stuff to do. 
Um, and so I was really happy when I came up with the idea of point. And so then I took the vase back out and I photographed it with some point, thinking, oh, we'll figure this out when I get there. Because I've never painted coins before. And they're small, there's a lot of detail on every one of them. And I, when I saw the painting yesterday, when I, when I saw it here in the gallery, I looked at those points and I thought, those are really a lot better than I thought they were. <laughs> they look like points. Um, so I was happy with that. And then sometimes in my paintings, I have used a very plain tabletop or just a, uh, a, just a, a, a plain box to set things on, sort of like an altar. Um, thinking more in religious terms, and there are those little rocks. And this is my very favorite orchid. Um, and the people who bought it got what I wanted out of it, and they set up sort of an altar way next to it, which I really appreciated. And they were so cute. I saw them at a, a show down in Scottsdale. <laughs> and they came because they wanted to see my work, but they also really wanted me to see what they'd done with it in their home. They were so cute, and I thought, they got it. Thank you. Um, just the really nice people. Um, and then I used bricks as a symbol of destruction of nature with all the building that we've done on top of it. And um, this is one of my very favorite irises. Um, and bricks are pretty fun to paint because they're just a mishmash of colors. And if you get the, the, the shape right, it reads as a brick. So I like painting bricks. Um, I don't know how much people want to live with bricks, but I like painting. Um, and they're a really good symbol. Um, and then I've also used uh, gift bags to make them look like a gift from nature, which they are. Um, and then one of my more recent symbols has been the curtain. And you can see it in the, the series of The Vanishing Pansy. Um, I found that they can be very expressive. And so in this painting, um, and, and roses, roses and tulips are both very wonderful in that their leaves sort of look like arms, which makes them a little bit human. And so here its arms are sort of pushing back the curtains. Um, I did name it Closing In, but for a long time I called it Defiance. Um, so it can go by either name. Um, and, but then I also found, you know, I, I used it to express climate change for this show, but I've also used it to show off a little diva. Okay. Um, now, Dutch painters, um, they use butterflies as symbols of resurrection. Um, there are a lot of ideas that I had that did not make it into the paintings for this show. Um, I, um, I'm using uh, some bees and butterflies as pollinators in my paintings. Um, but they're kind of double symbol because they are a sign also of those specific insects and bees of becoming extinct. Um, I don't know, do you get monarch butterflies here? Um, that the numbers of those have gone way down. I remember when I was, was not even a kid, but younger than I am now, um, and seeing them all the time in the summer. And now I'm lucky if I see one or two. Um, in fact, we let a, we, we have a, an access area for the power company and any other company that wants to use it behind our, at the back of our backyard. And, um, I, I can't believe I did this. I actually paint, planted some milk thistle back there. Now, I've spent a lot of my gardening life getting rid of thistles. And so to be out there planting them seemed a little odd, but I thought it's for the butterflies. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do my bit. Um, I'm not that happy with the dandelions in the yard. But what, I, what we decided was, okay, we'll live with them until they go to seed, because but the bees really like them, especially early in the summer and late spring. So we're living with the dandelions 
but when they go to sea, they're gone because we don't really want them making more. Um, another insect whose numbers are frightening, frighteningly diminishing are bees. Um, four of the five species that live in Hawaii are extinct. Four of the five. They are major pollinators. Um, without them, we don't have food. And so um, I'm planning to use bees in, in some future paintings. I'm not looking forward to painting those little tiny legs, but I will. Um, I've taken brushes and um, changed them for what I want them to be many times. And so I, I, you know, I see myself taking my smallest little brush and pulling out some of the hairs. Um, it might just be easier to pull out some eyelashes and try those, <laughs> but I will try it. Um, so when I started as an artist 40 years ago, I was not welcome in the boys club of artists in my area. Um, they, the, the only women that were a part of that group were girlfriends or wives, and no one else was really very welcome. And so I didn't really have a group of people to talk things over with or talk about the, the fun and the difficulties of being an artist. And so I was teaching art history, and I thought, well, uh, there's a lot of artists in the past. And so two of them that I, that I chose to sort of let, I have um, prints of their paintings in my studio are Maria Van Oosterwick and uh, Rachel Boish. Um, and you know, I think about them, and actually one of my goals in life, I'll point it out when we did the painting, is to paint a tulip as beautiful as the one in the painting by Maria Van Oosterwick that's at the Denver Art Museum. Um, I've become friends with the uh, curator of Meredith who purchased that painting for the Denver Art Museum, and I have thanked him many times because it has really influenced me. It's, if I can paint that well, because she was really good, if I can paint that well, I'll be really happy. Um, but I haven't found that tulip yet, and I haven't gotten to that level yet, but she's there egging me on every day. Um, so, you know, I, I was sort of communicating with them and reading their biographies. Uh, I was not having any seances in my studio. Um, don't be thinking that. Um, there have been many times when I wish they could show up and teach me. Uh, so far, not. Um, so the next best thing was getting to know them through their biographies and their artwork. And so four um, women from Dutch tradition that have influenced me are um, Clara P. Paters, uh, Maria Sibylis Marion, and I'll show you some images from each of them, Maria Van Oosterweg and Rachel Roy. When I was doing some research to put this together, um, I kind of went into it thinking, well, for some of these women, it's not going to take very long because there's just not that much information about them. Because I researched them when I was in graduate school, and there was not much like chicken scratch. Well, I was really happy to find that there is a whole lot more information about, about them than there used to be, um, because there's just been more interest in them. Um, they weren't really welcome in their boys clubs either, so we have one in common. Um, so with <coughs> Maria Sibylla Marion, do any of you know about her? Well, that's too bad, because she was really interesting. And there, I, I don't remember the title of the book, but I read her biography a couple of years ago, and it was absolutely fascinating. I'll give you a little bit of it, but if you're interested in more, it's the book that's about her that has a botanical, or I think insects on the cover. In, insect, though, yeah. They're, they're very scientific. Um, it, was a, it was a really good book. It made me feel like I lived such a boring life. Um, so she was German, and she was one of those people born with curiosity as not just her middle name, it should have been her first name. And she was the person to discover that caterpillars and moths or butterflies were of the same species. 
because they didn't know. I mean, there, there, there was a lot of magical thinking about where things came from. And, and so she was the one who was just fascinated with the little bugs, and her mom must have been really nice about bringing them home. And so she'd set up, um, you know, boxes or whatever places for them to live, and she'd bring them the food that, where she found them, and then she'd watch their lifetimes. And so she learned that there are several stages to these, to these lives. Now, I spent a lot of time in biology classes, and I can tell you, she was never mentioned. But she was the scientist who figured this out. And because she took the time, um, she was largely self-taught in her drawing and painting skills. Um, but her father ran a printing company, and she was allowed to look through the books and their pictures. That's part of how she got her education. Um, her mother's second husband was a flower painter, and he stimulated her interest in the natural world and helped her develop this very specialized pictorial style of painting with watercolors on vellum. Let me talk about vellum. You know, it's, it's kind of paper you get at the stationery store. But in those days, it was calfskin. Which makes me so glad I got to try watercolors in this century. So I didn't have to have my paint in peak ladders, and I didn't have to paint on animal skins. Life is so much better now. Um, and those skins were probably, I mean, paper's probably really cheap in, in comparison. Um, so her family was made of generations of entrepreneurs and mostly print publishers. So it makes sense that she sort of followed her scientific interests. No one at home was saying, oh, that's not girl stuff. Um, and so she came to support herself and expedition to South America and her daughters with her paintings. That's amazing. There were other artists at that time who were really struggling, but she and the other women that I'm going to tell you about here managed to do really well. And so she was very unusual for her time to be that free and out in the world and, you know, chasing down insects. But as she was painting and drawing the insects, she put in the, the plants that they lived on. The, the, she painted their homes and their dinner and did a very beautiful job of it. Um, she did have uh, two daughters with her, her husband. Um, he'd been one of her father's students who took over the printing business. And then he published her first book, uh, which was called The Wondrous Transformation of Caterpillars and Their Remarkable Diet of Flowers. You wouldn't see that with book stands now. Um, but it was published in two parts in 1679 and 1683, each illustrated with 50 engravings. So she did the drawings and, and the, the painting of them. And then she or someone else engraved copper plates, and those were used to print from. So it was a pretty tedious process. Um, and so she made these amazing volumes, um, and the third one was printed in 1717, just a couple of months after she died. Um, the descriptions uh, and engravings were based on her own observation of the lives of, of butterflies and moths. And then, in, in those books, okay, that was in her, I suppose, her early book. And then, in 1685, in fairly religious, um, um, I don't remember where she was living, but she left her husband. She said, I'm out of here. And she went to live with a, a small uh, religious group um, and, and lived in their community. She took her daughters. And there, she, there she, she learned a lot. And then when her mother died, um, she moved with her daughters to Amsterdam which was the center of world trade and the home of numerous scholarly collections. And there she found her true vocation and became associated with influential scientists of the city. It was like she found her people. And one of those scientists was Frederick Roysch, who was Rachel's father. 
and he was a professor of anatomy who gave her access to his prized collections of specimens that he and other scientists had collected all over the world. So basically, with him and, and other people who were collecting at the time, she had access to a world of the natural world. And so that really opened up her world and her curiosity. And he also connected her with his daughter, Rachel, who was, um, Maria was Rachel's teacher for a time. And she went on to become one of Europe's most famous floral painters. The religious community that she was a part of started a, a community called La Providence, which included a sugar plant plantation in Suriname which was a small country on the coast of northeastern South America. Now, if you think about where she was, and she decided to take a trip to South America with, her, with one of her daughters. Well, the older one had gotten married, and so she took her younger daughter. She sold all of her paintings, all of her prints. She sold everything she had to finance this trip. And she was there for two or three years. And she did this when she was 52 years old. Now, in those days, 52 was not the new 40. 52 at that time was probably a lot more like 72. And so she just sold all her stuff, collected up her daughter, got on the ship, and headed for South America. And said, well, I'm going to go there and see what's there for me to pay me I just can't even imagine that. Um, where she traveled to another continent, another country. She didn't know the language, she didn't know anything. But she said, this is what I'm going to do. And so she took off in 1699. She said, well, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, and, she, and, and she paid for it um, in many ways, but she financed the whole trip. And life in Suriname was difficult for many reasons, many you can probably imagine. Um, she made repeated expeditions into what she called the wilderness and the, which was the tropical interior of the country, and she co collected specimens and their food and took them back to where she was living and fed them and made drawings of them and waited for them to develop. And, but those expeditions, as you might imagine, were pretty harsh. Now, keep in mind that she was wearing the clothing of the day, which I think all the women in here would agree, we're glad we don't have to anymore. It makes most of us look like we live in pajamas, really. And so that's what she was wearing in this hot, humid place, going into the jungle. Um, it, it must have been horrible. Um, and then uh, um, she had uh, uh, enslaved people to be back the foliage and the thistles and the thorn bushes and other plants so that she could pass through. Even so, it was a difficulty. And another thing that made her life difficult there was that she and her work were considered peculiar. She's not normal. She's kind of probably used to that a little bit, but when all the people around her are thinking you're kind of odd and they're not really wanting to know you, that would make life more difficult. Um, she was jeered at by the, the Dutch colonists for looking for other things than sugar in the country because they colonized that area to, to grow sugar. And so sugar was all they thought about. And they thought, well, what are you looking at this for? We've got sugar. Look at the sugar. And she didn't know she wasn't having any of that. So, um, so she went along on her own way. And she found some really interesting plants, like vanilla, which is an orchid, um, cherries, figs, and grapes. So she's discovering these, and these other people are saying, oh, just look at the sugar, just look at the sugar. Um, they may have lived shorter lives. She was with the fruit. So anyway, she, one of the things she said was that the country was inhabited by a more, in, if, if the country had been inhabited by a more industrious and less selfish population, a reference to the Dutch colonists, then they would have understood more and they probably would have gotten those plants growing in Europe a lot sooner. Um, in 1705, her most famous book was published. Uh, it was a, a book about the metamorphosis, metamorphosis of, of uh, insects and their food sources. 
they always had to have the food. And when she was putting together the, the drawings and the paintings and then making the engravings so they could be printed, she wanted this, these volumes to be um, interesting to people who loved art and people who loved science. And so we find in her botanical and insect illustrations that they go way beyond scientific illustration, that they are really beautiful in their own right. Um, and that they would, you know, that they would be lovely in print form to hang on your walls if you were comfortable with all those books. Which people were then, not so much now. Um, and so her legacy is that of an intrepid and unconventional figure who forged a very successful and independent career as an artist. She boldly traveled to South America with her daughter, making new discoveries about the natural world. Again, not much attribution to her for that. Um, and then she came back to Amsterdam, and she, her daughters had worked as her assistants for, uh, probably most of their lives. And so they kept on with it, although um, the younger daughter did more so. Uh, but none of them went to other continents. Neither one of them did. So I have a couple of other images from her. But I just think this is so beautiful. Um, and it's, you know, it's only about this big. And as an artist who paints a lot of detail, and I think about painting something that size with that much detail, that's really amazing. I'm glad it was her. <laughs> Very glad. And the same thing with this. I mean, I look at all those little leaves, and I kind of want to go have a wear me. <laughs> they will be there tomorrow. So, I love her work, I love her story, and I really recommend the book. Another artist is Clara Peters, and her Peters. And she was producing large numbers of painstakingly rendered still lifes, typically displaying groups of, of valuable objects and elaborately decorated metal goblets, gold coins, exotic flowers, whatever she could get. And her compositions, um, you, you can usually tell when it's one of hers. Well, I don't think the time went fast for you guys, but it sure did for me. <laughs> okay. Um, much of what is known about her is through her paintings, um, because there wasn't a, a whole lot written about her at the time. Um, this is one of her um, floral paintings. And this painting, I mean, first of all, someone made that pie top. And someone made that picture with all of that engraving on it. So first of all, somebody had to make those things. And then she chose to paint them. Um, and sometimes she signed her name pretty boldly somewhere. And other times it was really very, um, very subtle. So this is a knife in, I think, this painting. Okay, and so if we look at it more closely, we see her signature along the front edge, and on the top of it, I mean, the metal work was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And so there we find some, some other motifs that were um, very important at the time. And she painted it. And then, if we look at this, this cover, she put her self-portrait in it, which was identifying her as a woman, and that she was the artist, and it also says, I paint really well. Um, today we know of 39 paintings by her, um, in which she is depicted um, in, in some ways. Um, her artwork had a really huge influence on other artists. Um, she was very prolific, she was very accomplished, and um, when I was in art school in the 80s, she wasn't in the books yet. She is now. Um, when I was teaching art history, she finally showed up. 
Um, okay. Oh, this is this is a self-portrait of her. And when, especially when women did self-portraits of themselves, women artists, they were advertisements for what they could do. So oftentimes they put in, if they're very elaborate, and so here she put in a bouquet, she put in these metal pieces that are very ornate, I mean, even that lace collar. Um, and, a, you know, just all of it. She And the coins, God lower those coins, um, that are showing off her skills. So this was more than just, oh, I'd like to make a nice picture of myself. It was an advertisement. And this is a portrait of Maria Van Oosterwicht. Um, I'm pretty sure these weren't her painting clothes. I, I love that in so many portraits where um, the artist is shown in elaborate clothing holding their Brushes and their palette. Really, um, that's not her painting outfit. I know for sure. Um, if it was, she got paint on it once, and it became her permanent painting outfit because it wasn't going anywhere else. So uh, I look at her here, and I, she looks very serene. When I first looked at this, I thought she looks really serene, and I think because of how she chose to live, she was. Um, she, she th these, the palette and the, the Bible here are things that she wanted people to know about her, that she was very religious and she was an artist. So here she's talking about herself and advertising her skills. Um, and her skills were, were enormous. Um, there's a story that she lived across a street or an alleyway from another artist and he was not as industrious as she was. Um, he'd sometimes get to the studio around noon, depending on how hungry he was, or how much he had to drink that morning, and he asked her to marry him. And she said, I'll make you a deal. If you can be in your studio from 7 to noon every day for a year, I'll marry you. It was a really safe bet. It didn't happen. Um, they, they continued on as friends, though. They had a long relationship. And apparently part of their relationship is documented by the arguments that their house staff had. But apparently her, the woman who worked for her did not get along with the woman who worked for him. And so it was noted that they did not get along very well. I really hope there's more than that to my legacy. Um, this is one of her early paintings. Now, look at how much is in this. There's the celestial glow, the flowers, a skull, a lot of things. And one of the things is on the page toward the front here, you see a little red butterfly. And she put those red animal butterflies in almost all of her paintings. Um, she sold her paintings to uh, King Louis XIV of France, the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, Leopold I, um, a, a king of Poland who purchased three of her paintings, um, Queen Mary Stuart, um, King William III, I mean she had a really great role as of people. Um, when you see one of her paintings it's pretty easy to identify them because they, they just have a very distinctive style, they're not as fluffy as many of the other paintings, they're, they're um, more compact. And this is a painting that they have at the Denver Art Museum, and that's the tulip that I hope to paint someday. And in this one, the symbolism is really very clear. Um, it's this, and, and she used this quite a bit, of using the flower and the tulip as a symbol for vanity, and the sunflower as the, the uh, eye of God. And she painted that sunflower amazingly. You know, I'm lucky enough to be able to see that painting. And I have gone to that painting several times when I was painting sunflowers. How did she make this inner work? She did it very detailed, and it's amazing. Um, this is another one of the paintings that I, I just think is so beautiful. Um, there are several of her paintings on the internet, but unfortunately many of them have not been restored very well. 
So I picked out the ones that I liked. Um, and this is then a portrait of uh, Rachel Roish. And here she collaborated with another artist. Um, and so he did the portrait and everything else, and then she painted the bouquet. She's like, nobody can paint those as well as I can, so I'll just finish this one. <laughs> I love that. Um, I just love that. Um, she married, and then she um, moved to The Hague, and she was the royal painter there for many years, with 11 children. So we have Maria and Clara, who didn't have any children at all. Okay, they had plenty of time to paint, but she had 11 children, and she still had an amazing output of paintings. Um, but she, she and her husband both did very well, so they could afford the household help for their 11 children. I mean, even just the time spent burying those children <laughs> could dip into our career. And so when, when I'm feeling like I'm really kind of whining and I'm overworked, I look at the picture of, of her painting and I just say, quit well, whining. <laughs> Um, I don't have any children, and I feel put upon sometimes. I can't even imagine 11 children, and they all lived. So, um, I have a couple more of her paintings. This one, I just think this is so beautiful. And again, another really gorgeous tulip. And the way that you can understand her paintings is they were very dynamic. Where Maria's were more compact, hers just sort of go in every direction, but they're very well composed. So you don't feel like you're looking at an amusement park. And then this one. So, there you go. Now time. Thank <laughs> you.